my main thesis here is to actually try and talk to you a bit about musculoskeletal conditions and health in the workplace. And also to accept there's a, a considerable amount of overlap inevitably uh, in the excellent things with which Andy was saying and, and the panel members were saying earlier. But perhaps to take a slightly broader perspective, and the broader perspective I really want to take is this. The workplace clearly sits in society. It's not an isolated unit on its own. And the people who come to work, for example, come to work with their own health and their own health conditions. So it's not just a case, which too often it has been, of looking at how do you prevent accidents at work and problems being caused by work, but actually how do you deal with people who come to work with problems, who are good people, who actually you want to enable to do their best within the workplace. And setting it within a wider perspective, I believe, of public health uh, and a public health approach to musculoskeletal conditions. But thirdly is really uh, trying to understand that there is uh, a lot of misunderstanding about what musculoskeletal health is. So let me just go on. Just a brief bit about uh, the Arthritis of Musculoskeletal Alliance, which is a charity. I'll just say it very quickly. It's 40 organizations coming together. Um, it's all the main patient organizations in the field of arthritis and musculoskeletal care. It's all the professional associations, the doctors, physios, uh, nurses, and the rest, and the research bodies all coming together and working together. Working together to improve musculoskeletal um, health, which is you know, our main objective uh, in there. And it's trying to uh, get over the, uh, the fact that there is not a lot of understanding about musculoskeletal conditions. People assume that it's back uh, pain and back problems. Well, it isn't. It's a lot bigger than that. And there are something like 10 million people in this country who suffer from some form of bone, joint, or muscle problems, whether they be arthritic conditions or otherwise. There are, in fact, 200 different arthritis conditions and back pain conditions, uh, which can be clearly defined. Some of them very rare, some of them are autoimmune diseases, and some of them are actually physical diseases, all of which may lead to a considerable amount of pain, stiffness, loss of mobility, uh, and loss of dexterity. Back pain, of course, is the most common one in the workplace, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, that in a second, but clearly it's a big, big issue. Um, that's just a slide of all the different organizations that we've got, but I won't keep delay you with that. The outline, really, I want to try and cover is, first of all, looking at the size of the MSK problem, then looking at some of the factors that are changing that, and actually the real threat is that if we don't take a more active approach to this, things will get worse before they get any better. And there are many factors, age, ac exercise, obesity, technology, which I'll come on to in a second. But I'm a solution-focused person, and I'm actually looking at what uh, can be done to actually help this situation, both for employers, for the state and the NHS, and for employees in terms of self-management. So that's the broad thesis that I'm uh, looking at. My, my theme is the one, I think, which will be shared very well by everybody in this room, and that is, work is good for you. And in fact, good work is even better. And what do I mean by that? Well, there is clear evidence that some of the problems we have is that there are mind-numbingly boring jobs, which very able people are being asked to do, and asked to be very grateful for the fact that they've got it. Now, we can all say, yes, any work is better than no work, and I think that's absolutely true. But it's also true that there is a problem with some work which is not well designed, which is not well thought out, and which therefore becomes a problem in it of itself for people being underemployed in terms of what it's being asked. But crucially in the central bit is that work is really important for the physical and mental health and well-being of anyone. Because for personal, social, and economic reasons, uh, their own prosperity, it's crucial. If you lose your job, the effect is not just on you, it's on your family, it's on your children, it's on your ability to live your life, it's on you crucially as well. It's on your self-confidence, it's on everything that goes with it. And one of my favorite academics, Professor Steve Bevan, who's um, at the Work Foundation, 
nice quote from him here, which says, for an individual, work can provide financial autonomy, self-respect, dignity, quality of life, and self-worth. And equally, you can turn that round and say the absence of that results in those kind of problems. So first, looking at the MSK, the size of the problem. It's a big problem. As I've said, in the United Kingdom, there are 10 million people with uh, musculoskeletal conditions or arthritis. Many of them will bring that problem to work with them. It's a similar problem throughout Europe. It's not unique to the United Kingdom. MSK conditions throughout the world are the largest single cause of years of disability, of living with years of disability, because many of the conditions don't kill you, but by God, sometimes you may feel as if uh, you know, it is killing you because the pain can be excruciating and it can actually have a very deleterious effect on your life until you get proper treatment and proper effective treatment. There are uh, treatments available. There are an increasing number of, of uh, treatments and interventions available, both at work and outside, and I'll come on to some of those, including, for example, ensuring the people who have got a newly diagnosed arthritis condition actually get into treatment and diagnosis quickly, not actually spending ages before they get near it. There are 7.6 million UK working days lost to musculoskeletal conditions. 60% of the working population will say that they suffer from an episode of back pain, for example, and I'll come on to some of that in a, bit, in a minute. And of course, as you all know, the two major causes of work absence, the two biggest causes, are depression and anxiety on the one hand and MSK on the other, the top two. But I think sometimes people make the assumption that it's, uh, you know, depression and anxiety is a, a much bigger problem. Well, no, it isn't. On any single working day today, the largest reason why people are off ill is because of musculoskeletal conditions, not depression and anxiety. Now, many of those people, fortunately, will have very short-term absence, a few days or so, and actually return to work. Um, uh, MSK is the second largest cause of long-term absence. Clearly, mental health is, because people uh, with mental health conditions tend to have longer periods off and sustained periods of off. MSK in the European Union is 60% of permanent working capacity. People falling out of the workforce. And the highly critical comment I'd make is that in many cases, that's simply because there isn't enough early intervention in there. And the complexity of it is that something like 30% of people who've got a musculoskeletal condition will also have anxiety and depression. At the very lim lim simplest level, anxiety that if they move in a particular way, it's going to hurt like hell, right? Or actually severe depression because they despair of things improving when in fact they can. I believe very firmly that failure to intervene early is a major cause. As we've already heard from several people, the idea of letting people go off sick and then, oh, you're being helpful because you don't actually go near them for the next month or so, uh, or make any inquiries about them for the next month or so, is insane. It's bad for them. It's very poor indeed for business. It's insane because if you intervene early, for example, on back pain, it is perfectly possible if you get to people within you know, a few days or, a, or a, a week or so at the most and get them into, and not just physiotherapy, but some, some form of intervention on that, the odds are they will return to work very quickly, whereas the reverse applies. If you let things drift past eight weeks or so, it becomes increasingly unlikely that they will return and the statistics show that once people have been off work for a year, the odds of them ever coming back uh, is, is actually much less than the odds of them either retiring or dying. So I believe that things can be reduced and can be solved. We have got an increasing um, set of problems that we're facing, uh, which is likely to make this MSK problem worse before it gets better. And just extremely briefly, first of all, the increasing use of technology whether we are talking about in any other workplaces, there are loads of people now, for example, sitting in front of computers all day. Now, the average physiotherapist will tell you that where you can, it is very sensible of people to actually try and get up and stretch every 30 minutes or so 
go and get a glass of water, go and do the radical thing of instead of sending this blasted email, go and talk to the person at the other end of the office and actually give them the message directly. It gets you moving. Moving for health is extremely important. But technology is actually re increasing the incidence of back pain and back problems because people are sitting in static positions. We are living increasingly sedentary lives when in fact we are built to be mobile and move. The lack of exercise is a national problem. It's a problem which is shared by employers and a responsibility that's shared by employers, but it is a national problem. There is increasing evidence that exercise is the magic pill for many health conditions, and in terms of arthritis and musculoskeletal conditions, exercise helps enormously. It strengthens muscles, it strengthens bones, it strengthens joints, it doesn't damage them when you actually do it properly. But we are increasingly leading lives where people don't do exercise, and evidenced as well by the next bit, which is the growing problems of obesity, of people not having healthy weights. Those two things are really crucial for this range of conditions, and really crucial indeed for the future, not least of which is the working age, an increasing working age. We are all, sorry, you are all, I'm now retired, you are all going to have to, the government says, work longer and longer. The age is now being pushed up to 68. The likelihood is that it'll go up to 69. Some countries it's already gone up to 70. Right? If we are going to actually sustain working in those periods, people are going to have to be reasonably active and reasonably fit Otherwise, you're going to end up with masses of people actually on sick leave. And uh, I love this, um, sorry, I'm, I'm one behind, aren't I, I guess? I love this cartoon, uh, which is, uh, says, uh, wrong cue, Mr. Grimley, Grimley, this is pensions, you're only 83. Yes, well, <laughs> may, maybe. So briefly, the MSK and the employers role. You are all experts in looking at the issues around prevention, lifting, handling, and work design. And I'm not going to talk about that anymore. Early intervention and getting in people into occupational health quickly, I've already said, I believe is absolutely crucial, including rapid access to physiotherapy and other interventions. Uh, physiotherapy and mental health conditions, getting people into talking therapies or whatever the case may be. Encouragement and support of staff from uh, line managers is absolutely crucial. To do that, you've got to educate the line managers. And we all know, I believe, that the evidence is that the more that you can actually ensure that people feel supported, as was said earlier on the panel, the greater the odds of their loyalty to the company, and in turn, their engagement scores will rocket, their enthusiasm will rocket. There's research which shows that in terms of return to work from back pain, the crucial, the crucial factor is actually the level of job satisfaction which people have. Where they have a satisfying job and one that they feel enthusiastic about and with their colleagues, they will return to work as quickly as they possibly can. Otherwise, they actually get discouraged and don't. Flexibility on return to work and flexibility with people with arthritis conditions is also really important. Promoting exercise, and you're already talking about that, walking, uh, gyms, anything you can do to encourage your workforce to engage in activity is essential, healthy eating, and there are huge cost savings to be made from all of that. The role of the state, well, the state is not very good at this. The lack of joined up government is amazing. The NHS does not see work as a clinical priority. Indeed, it doesn't see getting people back to work as a clinical priority. And believe me, this is truthful. A conversation I've had with two secretaries of state when I've actually produced the evidence, they say, yes, Phil, the evidence is really compelling. But unfortunately, it means that the NHS will have to spend more money, and the beneficiaries of this will be the Department for Work and Pensions, who will have less people on incapacity benefit. I said, well, hang on. I thought this was supposed to be a national health service of the whole population, not just rivalry between one, one department and another. But they don't. That lack of, of uh, enthusiasm has resulted in lack of early investment in early intervention. We've had the fit no uh, process, but GPs are not very enthusiastic about it. There's a new scheme that's coming out, which here is called Health and Work Assessment, is now called Fit for Work, which is a new initiative, which they've only partly done. 
And the partly done is that um, in future, from the beginning of October, there will be, uh, I believe, something like after four weeks of absence, the GP is supposed to refer people on to an assessment arrangement. Unfortunately, that assessment arrangement is go probably going to be by telephone. And the gap, I believe, is that it will provide assessment, it will provide advice, but it won't provide any treatment. So you, I believe, as employers, are going to have to find the gap in that. And then, finally, is employees' responsibility, which I believe is really great and important. It is a question of cooperation. It's a question of partnership. It's a question of people understanding the need for themselves to remain active, to remain healthy, to remain with a healthy weight, to actually uh, seek the treatment that they need and seek it early. Exercise, weight management, and building people's self-confidence, I believe, is absolutely crucial uh, in terms of where we go. And seeking and communicating what adjustments are needed. The access to work uh, uh, of the government policy is actually one which is new. So in conclusion, I believe that there are potentially, it's uh, musculoskeletal conditions, is a neglected area, it's big and, and uh, it's growing, but positive action can result in very big gains. Early intervention is really crucial. In Madrid, the Work Foundation have done a major study in Madrid, which demonstrates that early intervention systems, not just physiotherapy, can save 11 euros for every one euro actually invested in it. It's well worth doing. And the same with other health interventions, physiotherapy and others, which they're supportive employers, <coughs> um, the uh, arrangements for uh, ensuring that exercise, weight and work design is there. But the crucial bit at the end of it is where I began, that this is not just a problem of the workplace. It's not just a problem of safety in the workplace. It is a problem of society addressing it and seeing that the workplace is an extremely important part of it if, in order to ensure better health for people with musculoskeletal conditions. Thank you.